proceed immediately, personal injury accident, corner of Freston Road and Queen Street, ambulance on way, message timed at 10.40. Charlie Victor 1, message received, over and out. Sir. Morning. It's all yours, lads. Do what you can. But it doesn't look as if you can do much for him. Poor bastard. Some people reckon you get hardened to it all. Like hell you do. Especially when there's no apparent reason. No attempt to pull up. No skid marks. Nothing. Shouldn't have been drunk. Not at this time of day. Wouldn't have been the car either. Looked brand new. Mind you, why not? Drake fault? Wouldn't be the first time. The question is, whose fault? One simple slip up and then that lot. So where's the connection? I'm glad I don't have to get to the bottom of that one. There must be a reason. In my book, there's got to be a reason for everything. But where do you start? I suppose if you look at it cold, a new car is just a bit of machinery with a particular specification. Not that this chappy will look at it that way, when he's busy choosing which model to buy. Take this one. A 1500cc four-door family saloon. Simply enough specification, maybe just what he wants. The thing is, there are three and a half thousand parts to that car, and they've all got a specification as well. How about this for size? Comfortable enough, and plenty of leg room. If only the seat would lock. I suppose it's only when things like that don't come up to specification that they ever get noticed at all. And as far as he's concerned, it's just a fault. Pity about that. He quite liked it, really, but, well, the quality wasn't up to much. Now, that's more like it. A quality car, if ever he saw one. Costs four times as much, of course, but what do you expect? In fact, what he'd really be paying for is simply a much more refined specification. Air conditioning, electric windows, and all the rest of it. And that by itself is no guarantee of good quality. Especially when the door won't open. Uh, uh, Ask him whose I fault. Bloody believe it. And he'll say, the factories. Uh. I suppose as far as the customer's concerned, a chap on final inspection like Bob Giles is the last hope between a quality car and trouble. Bit unfair, really. No matter how seriously he takes the job, it's asking a lot for a bloke to go through a car from nose to tail in just a couple of minutes. Complicated things, motor cars, when you think about it. Thousands of bits and pieces made and put together by thousands of different people. To an outsider, it's a bit of a miracle that any of them reach the end of the line at all, let alone in the numbers they do. In theory, they all ought to be perfect. But right from the beginning, little things have been going wrong. Some will be spotted and put right, but others, well, you ask Bob Giles. He does his best, of course, and he can't do more than that. From here, the car's signed over to sales, and then it'll be off to a dealer showroom. If there are any faults, they go off with it, and by then, it's too late. I should think there must be hundreds of blokes at Leyland, like Bob Giles, checking this and checking that, just to make sure that someone else has done their job right. They may be called quality inspectors, but they spend all their time looking for bad quality. All right, every factory's got to have some kind of control, but even the best system won't be perfect. Faults will still slip through, bound to. What's important is how faults happen, not trying to find them once they have happened. So where do you begin? 
motor car may be conceived between product planning, styling and the marketing people. But this is where it's born. At least that's what most of the designers who work in here will tell you. This is where specification begins. Nearly everything that goes into or onto or under a new car starts off in places like this as a pencil line on a bit of paper. And it's all got to be checked before it goes out. That's George's job. Just another kind of inspector, really. Making sure all the information's accurate before he signs it off. That drawing was one of Nigel's efforts. He's been working on a brake mod for the last three weeks and it's got to be finished by Thursday. Still, pressure doesn't worry Nigel. He's done it all before on the last brake job anyway. And that worked all right. At least he thinks it did. Looked dead right on paper. Hello, I wonder what the production people will make of that little lot. Six thou or sixteen thou? Well, it still seems clear enough to Nigel. And if they don't know by now, that's their lookout. Of course, he's forgotten that the drawing will have to be copied. And that might make his specification even less readable. As far as he's concerned, that drawing is gospel. The gospel according to St. Nigel. Right, here's that drawing you ordered. Cheers, Roger. I'll check it out and come back to you, OK? Yep. This is Charlie, a development engineer. He's the kind of chap that never takes anything as gospel, particularly drawings. So out comes a pencil and the confusion on his copy of Nigel's drawing gets put right. Designers? You spare a minute, Ken, please. Problems. And all because it never occurred to Charlie to pass the information on. Oh, he knows about the confusion, but that's not enough. Ah, Nigel's doubtful specification is still gospel as far as everyone else is concerned. But that's their tough luck. 60? That looks more like 80, though, to me. 80? Communication? Forget it. Yes, that's 80, though. I admit, isn't it very clear? Now, this is the Marina 1.34 door, mm -hmm. and perhaps you'd like to take a seat. It's a very practical family solution. Not that a lack of communication somewhere in a Leyland factory would bother the customer. At least, not at this stage. At the moment, it's the idea of ownership that appeals to him. Comfort, convenience, lazy weekends by the sea and all the rest of it. Even after all these years, motoring has lost none of its charm. For crying out loud, Charlie, what the hell didn't you tell somebody? One of the stupid things I've ever heard of. Now look, Ted, I don't have to take that sort of talk from anybody. You know how long I've been doing look, this if job. you hadn't kept it yourself for the past five weeks, we wouldn't be sitting here now with egg in our faces, would we? Oh, it's all my fault, is it? That's nice, that is. What about him? He hasn't said a bloody word yet. At last, right, communication. Where do we go the language may be a bit strong, but at least they're all talking to one another. It is. It took a long time for everyone to realise they were working to two sets of drawings, but the penny dropped eventually. And the gospel according to St. Nigel has been put right. Of course, it's a compromise and a bit late. A couple of thousands of quids worth of jigs and pre-production parts have been slung on the scrap heap and a lot of time wasted. But at least they're all working to the same specification now, and that's something. Assuming, of course, the compromise hasn't got implications that nobody's realised. This is Reg. He's got his own ideas about specifications as Reg. They call Reg a process planning engineer. It's his job to analyse drawings like Nigel's and work out how and where the various bits and pieces are going to be made. Which plant, which shop, which machine, which tools and all the rest of it complicated job, but he's good at it. He'd rather have been a development engineer, but, well, that was until Wendy arrived. She types up the information that Reg gives her onto method sheets for the operators in the machine shop. Wendy's problem is she doesn't know the seriousness of what she's doing. Now, she can type all right, but to her it's just numbers. Point double O this and point double O that. Enough to drive you around the bend. But when you think about it, that method sheet is another specification, and it's either right or wrong. 
One mistyped number amongst that lot, and it could take days or even weeks to trace. And by then, the damage is done. Not that a mistyped number on a bit of paper somewhere in a Leyland factory would bother the customer. At least, not yet. When a window gets stuck in the pouring rain, it's simply a question of survival. And the charm of owning a new Leyland vehicle begins to suffer. Leyland must have scores of shops like this all over the country. Thousands of different machines, some new, some on their last legs. Thousands of different blokes and all. Men and machines turning out millions of parts every hour of the working day. And every man and every machine working to a particular specification. Take old Harry. Served an apprenticeship and been with the company ever since. Good lad, Harry. Knows what it's about. Thinks about fishing most of the time, true. But even with his clapped out machine, he can work to tolerances that'd make most operators' eyes cross. Even after all these years, he takes a pride in what he does. And you can tell that by his scrap rate. Then there's Lofty. Nice enough lad, but, well, a different attitude altogether. You don't have to be a mind reader to know what Lofty thinks about most of the time. In fact, the foreman reckons Lofty's output depends almost entirely on the bust measurement of the page 3 pinup. Not so bad today. Size 38. But the scrap? Well, you can't get it right all the time, can you? Poor old Jim. Just not his day. Hey, Fitz! Fitz! What's about motive? Does that look like a seven or a five to you? I've got a seven here. There nice go, fella, Jim. Conscientious, gets the job done. But thanks to Wendy's mistake on the method sheet, he's just realised he's been turning out faulty bits for half the day. And if there's one thing Jim can't stand, it's wasted effort. Uh, yeah. What are you going to do about it? Does this look like a seven or a five to you? It's like a nine to me. Bert, none too pleased either. Someone's going to have to decide whether the mistake's critical or not. If it is, that means even more scrap off standard costs because most of the faulty parts have already been fixed to the rest of the system. Time, money and materials straight down the drain again. Hello, Fred, is that you? You sit and tell me, old darling, because I think you ought to. Not that the scrap rate at a Leyland factory bothers the customer. At least, not when he's busy looking for that confounded squeak. Still, whether he likes it or not, he's paid for his fair share of the waste along with every other customer. After all, somebody's got to pay for it. It's a kind of surcharge to cover foul-ups. Just as well he'll never find out. Then there are the other firms, I suppose. Over 3,000 different outfits who supply all kinds of bits and pieces that Leyland farm out. Take this one. Produce brake components for the whole of the British motor industry. And good at it. They've probably got their fair share of good blokes like Harry and Jim and their fair share of chaps like Lofty and the problems that go with them. No factory's perfect. Same old story in any plant. Make it, assemble it, check it. It's a pity more suppliers don't control quality as well as this one does. But even so, the occasional fault will still get through. It's the law of averages. Maybe it's something that won't matter, but it could be vital. And once again, it'll be too late. Not that the customer will ever accuse the supplier of a faulty component. It's a Leyland car, so Leyland get the blame. Shut up! Well then, what's this lot got to do with brakes? Nothing, except that sometime all these various parts have got to fit together, exactly, with holes in the right places for brake pipes and all the rest of it. Not really critical. That is, unless the chap who designed one of the press tools was working from Nigel's original drawing. The wrong one. Maybe someone forgot to tell him. One, didn't you son? Only a bit out so it may never notice. But along with all the other things that hole being off the mark could make all the difference. 
a bad fit instead of a comfortable one. Not that Dave will ever know. Dress up, panel in, dress down. He could do it with his eyes shut. It strikes me that Leyland's physical problems don't help much either. Factories and plants all over the place, parts and components flying from one site to another. Apart from the headache of organising it all, there's always the risk of damaging stuff on the way if you're not damn careful. Mind you, no one could accuse Ted of not being careful. Learn to drive in the army, did Ted. I'm proud of it. Checks the trailer carefully. Checks the load carefully. Protects it from the weather carefully. And drives carefully. Nothing's going to get damaged if Ted has his way. Not like some people he knows. Just look at it. 6,000 quid worth of engines on board and you'd think he was working for the Pony Express. <laughs> Just makes you want to weep. But Not that the customer is bothered about poor materials handling back at Leyland. At least he wasn't. But he is now. Bloody rust. And if there's a bit here, there's probably a bit somewhere else. Thousands of different parts made by thousands of different people. Most of them bang up to specification. Perfect. And others? Well, not so perfect, or maybe damaged in transit. A bit difficult to tell which is which by now, I should imagine. Mind you, that's nothing to do with this chap. Busts his gut to keep the track supplied. Busts a few other things as well. A car every two minutes. I suppose this is what most people think making cars is all about. Every fault begins and ends on the assembly line as far as they're concerned. If only they knew. These blokes can only fit the parts they're given to fit. If the part's right, okay. If it's not, how can they tell? It's too late to start checking now, even if they had the time. Which they don't. You ask Sid about time. Two minutes to fix something or other, connect up so-and-so and tighten up such-and-such. -such. Just two minutes. He can just about do it all right, but it's not easy. And he knows why. He can hardly move for people. Just look at that track. Laid out 20 years ago to build minis, when minis were the simplest thing on four wheels. Best facilities in Europe then. Now look at it. More blokes doing more jobs on a more complicated car. And still the same space. That's not Sid's fault. That was a management decision. And if Sid had the chance, he'd tell him exactly what he thought of it. And he'd be right. Even now, it only takes just one bloke to do something down further up the track and you could be in trouble. This lad's got no idea what's been going on and if there was any damage, chances are it'd be too small to notice. You've got to be fair. He's only got two minutes to do his job like everyone else. Not that the customer is particularly interested in anyone else's problems. He's got his own. Eleven faults in a thousand miles, and those are just the ones he's found so far. Right, okay, so we'll... Not surprisingly, what he thinks of Leyland cars at the moment would make your hair stand on end. Uh, Mr. Gibbs. Oh. You're for a service, isn't it, sir? Yes, but it's not just a service. I've got a lot of other things I want you to fix while they're Oh, would you just like to step this way, sir? All right. Do sit down. Now oh. <coughs> oh, then, bit of trouble, is there? A bit. I've only had that car a month, and I've sick to death of it already. I've got a list of complaints here. Shall we start now? There again, it could be that some of those faults should have been spotted during the pre-delivery inspection in the dealer's workshop. That was Pete's job. And he's really choked. I mean, why should he spend his time chattering? That's Leyland's job, not his. And that lot in the showroom wants shooting as well. Make a promise to a customer which means he's only got an hour to do a full super cover check before the car goes out. A bit of luck, he might get half of it done, but the rest? Well, that's too bad. So it all comes back to poor old Bob Giles and inspectors like him. Not really. 
They can only try and catch things that have gone wrong and make sure they get put right. But that's not going to affect the quality of the car much, because by then the standard's been set. I suppose there's something wrong with all this stuff as well, is there? It looks like a right hospital. Look, we started the boat here. And so the pleasure of owning a new car has finally disappeared. Oh, it'll be put right, of course it will. The warranty will cover that. But Leyland will have to pay the bill, and the customer will never have quite the same amount of confidence in the company's vehicles as he once had. You wouldn't believe the fun I had with this he bought more than just a new car. He bought problems and inconvenience at the same time. And that's not much of a bargain when you think about it. Next time, he might buy one of those foreign jobs he's heard so much about. I've had this car for one month. Now, you just take a look down there. One month old. Do you call that right? Me? You try closing this door. You've been lucky if you do it first time, I can tell you. Well, I think we'll need about three days to sort this lot out, sir. Three days? Oh, God help us. Well, we want the job done properly, don't we? Yes, but it's a bloody pity someone didn't think of that in the first place. Oh. A quality car is any vehicle that comes up to the exact specification the customer is paying for. It's easy to say, but a lot harder to make. Even with the best plant and machinery in the world, you can still have quality problems. Ask the customer about that. I suppose what it boils down to is people. They're the quality connection. It may take all kinds to make a world, but only one kind can make a good car. The kind that do their best in spite of the problems and get it right first time. The result is either good quality or bad quality, because there's nothing in between. Faults will always happen, of course they will, but the fewer the better. Sometimes they can be pinned down to particular people. Other times it could have been anyone. But faults don't happen on their own. Somewhere along the line, somebody slipped up. At best, a bit of bad quality could irritate a customer and put him off Leyland cars for life. That's bad enough. At worst, maybe once in a million. Able Tango 1 to HQ. Go ahead. Reporting serious accident, corner of Preston Road and Queen Street. Corner of Preston Road and Queen Street. Ambulance on way. Message timed at 10.40. Charlie Victor 1. Message received. Over and out. On June the 16th, on the corner of Preston Road and Queen Street, an accident occurred that took the lives of an infant, a motorist and a pedestrian. The cause of the accident was never established. Morning, sir. Aye. It's all yours, lads. Do what you can. It doesn't look as if you can do much for him. Poor bastard.